Hello, and welcome to Real Cheating Story. It was another day in the big city, a day to solve more crimes. You see, I'm a cop. My name is Joe Friday. I love watching the old reruns of Dragnet. In an hour, Jack Webb and Harry Morgan could solve a crime. I wish it was that easy today. I'm a cop too, only I'm not on television. I've been on the force for 14 years and love my job. The only thing I love more in life than my job is my wife, Lydia, and my two daughters. There is nothing in this world I wouldn't do for them. I ran into a problem last Monday, and I've been trying to deal with it. When I got home, Lydia had my favorite dinner on the table. It was something she hadn't done for months. Then she told me that she wanted to know if it was alright with me if she went out with her friends on Friday night. I usually wouldn't have a problem with that, except she didn't look at me when she asked. You see, I have a sort of sixth sense about people. I can look at someone's face and know if they're telling the truth or not. It's helped me in my career. I may not always know what the truth is, but I can tell if I'm being lied to. I have to laugh when I watch Judge Judy on TV, the way she tells people to look her in the eyes. I believe we both share that gift. Back to Lydia. She looked at me when she asked to go out, but when I asked her who else was going, she looked away and mentioned a few girlfriends' names. When I asked her if anyone else would be there, she hesitated and said she wasn't sure. I could tell she wasn't being entirely honest. We've never lied to each other before. Or at least, I thought we hadn't. We've had one of those marriages that people admire. Where are you all going? I asked. This time, she looked me in the eyes. We're thinking of going to Columbus, to a couple of places. Barb's making the arrangements. We'll probably spend the night there. We don't want to be driving drunk or even slightly tipsy. I'd hate to have to call you to bail me out of jail. She smiled, but it seemed forced, like she was still hiding something. I was almost certain Lydia had always been faithful to me, but something felt off. I didn't want to accuse her without any proof, but her behavior left me unsettled. I needed time to think. My daughters came in and hugged me, as they always did, and instantly lifted my mood. We sat down to dinner but Lydia avoided eye contact with me for most of the meal. I finally told her she should go out if she wanted to, that I'd stay home with the girls and we'd find something to do. It had been a while since I'd spent much quality time with them. How we met. I met Lydia 12 years ago. My partner and I were on routine patrol, and we decided to set up a radar gun in an area where there were reports of speeders. My partner, Jan, was a female officer and one of the best. I trusted her with my life. We set up alongside the street, and the traffic was light, with most vehicles staying within 5 miles per hour of the limit. Then one car clocked in at 8 miles per hour over, and I waved it over. When I walked up to the car, there she was, the cutest gal I'd ever seen behind the wheel. It was Lydia. She gave me a shy smile and asked why I'd pulled her over. You were exceeding the speed limit. May I see your driver's license, registration, and proof of insurance, please? I was trying to stay professional, but she definitely caught my attention. Where were you headed in such a hurry? I asked. I'm a senior at the university, on my way to take a couple of finals. I'm sorry, officer, but I thought I was going the speed limit. Your radar must be off. Wrong thing to say to a cop. I went back to the cruiser and started writing up a ticket. Our radar equipment was checked daily, no chance of it being off. If she just apologized... I probably would have let her off with a warning. Jan, watching from the cruiser, chuckled. You're not giving that girl a ticket, are you? I can't believe you're not just giving her a warning. I want to see her again, I replied. I've got her address here. Maybe I'll stop by when I'm in the neighborhood. Are you nuts? Laughed January. You think she'll go out with you after giving her a ticket? You're one mixed up officer, Jerry. Jan. I can't stop her for a violation and then ask her out. That wouldn't be right. I went back to Lydia's car, handed her the ticket and her documents. Sorry, miss, but you will have to slow down in residential areas, I said as I handed her the ticket and her papers. What? No warning. You're just giving me a ticket. She looked at me. You were speeding, Mississippi. You have a court date if you want to fight it, I replied. See you in court, officer, was the last thing she said to me. A week later, when I went to court, she was there. Not the young schoolgirl with a ponytail, but dressed like a woman ready to go out. She looked stunning in her dress, and although she appeared composed, her outfit was certainly designed to make an impression. 
I guess she was going to try to win over the judge. Lydia looked over at me, and I smiled back at her. I could see she was ready to pull the, I'm sorry, the officer must have made a mistake routine until she saw the judge. It was Judge Hazel Hawkins. When Lydia looked back at me, I had a grin on my face. I could see it made her mad, but I also saw something more, a kind of spark between us. I gave my statements and a report of the morning's radar check. Everything was in order. Judge Hawkins then asked Lydia for her side of the incident. Lydia knew she had nothing to back up any allegations and mumbled a few words. The judge told her she was in the wrong and found her guilty of speeding. Judge Hawkins glanced over at me. I knew she was wondering why I'd given this young woman a ticket. She just shook her head. I headed out into the lobby to wait for Lydia. When she came out, she walked right up to me and said, I hope you're happy that you got your man. In this case, a woman, I smiled at her and decided to go for it. Will you go out with me? What? You give me a ticket, ruin my weekend, and you think I'll go out with you? She asked, but she was looking at me and I could tell she was intrigued. How did I ruin your weekend? It's not even here yet, I asked. I was going to go out with my classmates and celebrate passing my finals, but now I have to pay the stupid fine you cost me, she said. First off, you were speeding. And second, I want to take you out. This weekend would be great. I'll take you wherever you want to go, and it won't cost you anything. I knew I was winning her over. What about my friends? What am I supposed to tell them? She asked. Try the truth. Tell them you had to pay a speeding fine and won't have the money to go out with them. Tell them the cop felt some remorse and offered to take you out for dinner and dancing and wants your hand in marriage. I laughed. Lydia laughed too. I'll take you up on the dinner and dancing, but the marriage will have to wait. Let's see how dinner goes first. Okay with me, but you're going to love me. I can see it in your face. I teased. I'll pick you up Saturday at 7 o'clock. Is that agreeable with you? Seven's fine, and I'll wear this dress if you promise not to wear your uniform. I don't want anyone to think I'm getting arrested. Need my address? She asked. Nope, already have it. I've been driving by for a week hoping to see you. So it's you who's been driving by my house? My mom said that the police have been protecting our area more than usual. Isn't that stalking? She smiled. If anyone else kept an eye on you, it would be stalking. But I'm here to protect and serve. I was protecting your neighborhood from unwanted crime. I was protecting you and your family. My mom will be glad to know that. I'll tell her tonight so she can sleep much better knowing you were there, she smiled. Our date was fantastic. Even though she was maybe 5 feet 3 inches and about 115 pounds, and I was 6 feet 3 inches and at least 220 pounds, we were like two peas in a pod. It was almost love at first sight. Or at least, love at first date for me. From that night on, we became the best of friends. About two years later, we got married. Two years after that, Kira was born. A year and a half later, we had Brittany. Her mom and dad loved me, and I loved them. My parents felt the same way about Lydia. We really were one big happy family. After graduating from college, Lydia became a school teacher. After the kids were born, her mom would watch them for us during the day. We very rarely argued, and we always talked through our problems. I would tell her about the cases I was working on, and she would tell me about the kids in her class. She once asked me if I would do a safety talk for her students since some of them were acting up. She figured that me talking to them might help straighten them out, and she was right. Now, at the beginning of every semester, I talk about crime and punishment to her class. Lydia says that when she tells her students I'm her husband, they behave a lot better. We have two groups of good friends. She has her fellow teachers and school administrators, and I have my fellow officers and their families. We lead busy lives, but we always make time for each other. I trust her, and she trusts me. Our marriage is built on that mutual trust. I should mention that there are people out there who, for some reason, hate to see happy marriages and will always try to break them up. Lydia and I have talked about this many times, and we both stay vigilant in those situations. I have never been unfaithful to her, even though there have been opportunities. I guess some women are drawn to the idea of being with a cop. If a woman gets overly friendly with me at a party, I try to stop it by being polite but firm. If that doesn't work, I find Lydia and spend time with her. When that happens, Lydia will give me a kiss and a little smile. 
There's no way I would risk our marriage for something meaningless. In our 10 years of marriage, I've been approached by quite a few women, so it stands to reason that someone as good-looking as Lydia has experienced the same, if not more. A few times, she has come to me for help when a situation got uncomfortable, and I've always taken care of it. The situation I'll tell you about happened at one of those parties where my friend's brother was bothering Lydia. She came up to me and mentioned that Bill was getting a little too forward. I asked her if he had tried anything, and she said no, but he kept pushing the situation. I walked up to Bill, who told me what a beautiful wife I had. I responded directly, saying, Thank you. She's my life, and if any man ever tried to make advances on her, I would have no problem confronting him. There are many ways to handle that kind of situation. After saying that to Bill, I returned to Lydia, wrapped my arms around her, and gave her a kiss. Later, I asked her if she had any more issues with Bill, and she told me that he treated her as if she had the plague. She inquired about what I had said to him, and I told her that I expressed my love for her and that I would do whatever it takes to protect her. She said it worked. I had to talk to a few guys during our marriage, but I figured Lydia could handle the rest. I truly believe Lydia has always been honest with me. There were a few times we stopped associating with certain couples if either of us felt uncomfortable. We agreed it was best to remove ourselves from those situations. Believe me when I say there is a lot of questionable behavior happening in the world. I see it frequently. I do my best to keep my wife and kids safe from any negative influences. About six months ago, a lot of things changed. Looking back, I realized that much of it was my own doing. Jean and I received a call about shots fired in a residential neighborhood, and we were the first ones on the scene. As I prepared to enter the house, Jean was my backup at the door with her weapon drawn. I pushed the door open. It was unlocked. Upon entering the family room, I was met with silence, followed by a moan from a bedroom down the hallway. I cautiously made my way down the hall and saw a light on in the far bedroom. When I walked in, I found a woman in a nightgown who had been shot at least three times, twice in the chest and once in the forehead. On the floor in front of her was a man in a suit, blood covering his chest, a gun in his hand. I saw him move, then he seemed to lose consciousness. I took a few steps forward and kicked the revolver out of his grip, bending down to check his pulse when I heard a scream. It was Jean. I quickly turned around and saw her standing in front of a doorway across the hall. I rushed to her, looking into the room where two young children lay on the bed, both shot once in the head. I was nearly overcome with emotion. What had happened here? Jean radio dispatch, requesting backup and an ambulance. I was assigned to the investigation and it hit me hard, a family destroyed. The man was barely alive, but unconscious. The paramedics rushed him to the hospital while the woman and the two young children were pronounced dead. Was it a triple murder and an attempted suicide? Was he the father and husband? This deeply affected me. The woman was the same age as Lydia, and the kids were similar in age to my two girls. What could drive a man to that point? When I got home that night, I greeted my family and hugged them tightly. That evening, I shared my feelings with Lydia about the murder investigation that was weighing on my mind. I told her I might be home late for a while until I could sort through what had happened, and she said she understood. The days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months. I became distant, stopped communicating with Lydia, and started spending more time at the club where the cops hung out. In hindsight, I realized I had become paranoid and obsessed with the case. Whenever I thought about the murder, I couldn't help but think of Lydia and my girls. Over the next six months, I put my marriage on hold and noticed changes in Lydia. She stopped talking to me and would often argue with me about my club visits. The more she yelled, the more I felt compelled to escape to the club. I could sense our marriage slowly falling apart, yet my mind couldn't comprehend what was happening. During those months, Lydia seemed to dress differently for work, and I found myself scrutinizing her for signs of infidelity. No, she wouldn't do that to me. I was just imagining things. Last week, my supervisor sent me to see our psychologist at the station. She suggested that I was talking to the wrong person and should really be opening up to Lydia about everything. Helen, the doctor, was a good friend to both Lydia and me. She suggested that I have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Lydia and was confident that Lydia would understand. On Monday, I got home from work and Lydia had steak and mashed potatoes on the table. 
This was when she asked me about going out with her friends on Friday. I wanted to discuss my concerns with her but felt this probably wasn't the right time. I was scared and began to wonder if Lydia might have an affair, or if she already had. I kept telling myself that our love for each other was too strong for that. I told her I would watch the kids on Friday, thinking I was getting back to normal, but I wasn't really sure. I considered telling her she couldn't go, but what would that accomplish? I needed a different approach. That night, I attempted to be intimate with Lydia, but it felt different. It was as if she was only participating because I had said she could go out with her friends. I hoped I was wrong about everything. On Tuesday, Jean was out on maternity leave, leaving me without someone to confide in. I had a new partner riding with me, but I wasn't about to share my issues with him. I needed to find a way to handle this. When I got home, I kissed my daughters, who hugged me back and climbed onto my lap while we watched one of their favorite shows. Lydia entered the room, greeting us and announcing that dinner was almost ready. I watched her closely for any signs of change, particularly as we talked. During dinner, I had an idea. Let's do a plan B this weekend, I suggested. How about you skip going out with your friends on Friday, and we take the girls to the amusement park? We can even spend the night. We haven't had a family outing in ages. She was upset and expressed her frustration, saying, No, you make your reservations and spend some time with the girls. I'm going out with my friends. Lydia was clearly hurt, and after a moment, she excused herself to the bathroom in tears. The girls looked scared and asked if mommy was alright. I assured them she was just upset, and everything was fine. Kira, my youngest, asked, Daddy, are you still going to take us to the park on Saturday? Sure, sweetheart, why not? I replied, we can go to the park and ride the rides. Kira responded, I wish mommy could come with us. I felt bad for the girls. They loved both their parents, and I realized I shouldn't have mentioned it in front of them. I decided I would take them anyway, and make the best of it. On Wednesday, I was increasingly worried about my marriage due to my actions over the past six months. I felt as if I was pushing Lydia away. Was I driving her into the arms of someone else? I needed to address my concerns without making accusations. When I got home, Lydia mentioned she was going shopping for clothes to wear out on Friday. I wanted to shout at her that we needed to talk, but I held back. After she left, I took the girls to McDonald's for dinner. Lydia had told me she was going shopping with her friend Sally, and as I drove by Sally's house, I spotted Lydia's car. I felt guilty for checking up on her. It wasn't something I was proud of. After dinner, we returned home, and while the girls watched TV, I checked emails and messages around the house. I even went down to the basement to check the caller ID on an unused phone. I noted a few unfamiliar numbers, just in case I needed them later. When Lydia returned home, she had several shopping bags. I asked her what she had bought for her night out. She looked at me skeptically. So now you're interested in what I wear, she asked. I replied, I'm just trying to be a good husband and show interest in what you do. If you don't want to share it with me, that's fine. She brought out a cute black dress, saying, Here, I bought this. It's pretty, I said. I know you'll look great in it. But it bothered me. The dress was quite revealing, and I felt uncertain about how to respond. I noticed other bags and asked what else she had purchased. She went back to the bedroom and returned with pajamas. I got these for home, she said, avoiding eye contact. That indicated to me she did plan to wear them elsewhere. The other bag contained a couple of outfits for the girls to wear at the amusement park with me on Saturday. The girls beamed and kissed their mother for buying them something, which was typical of her. Always thinking of the kids. She gathered her packages and put them back in the bedroom. Then she told the girls it was time to shower and get ready for bed. After putting them to bed, she took a shower herself. I glanced into one of the bags I had seen her bring in but not show me, and it contained a striking pair of black lingerie that would complement the dress she bought. I couldn't help but wonder why she hadn't shown them to me. Perhaps she was afraid I would be upset. When she came out of the shower, I told her I was going to the club. I needed some time to think of a counter plan. When I got home, she was already asleep. On Thursday, I got up and kissed the girls and even kissed Lydia before heading to the station. While on patrol, I had an idea. I stopped by the corner flower shop and bought a bouquet of mixed flowers for Lydia. Her favorite flower was yellow carnations, but I didn't want her to know these were from me. 
I had the floor assign the card to a special lady, adding, can't wait until this weekend, and signed it simply as, your friend. Lydia loved fresh flowers. Whenever she went to the store, she always liked to buy a small bouquet and put it on the table. I instructed the flower shop to deliver them, and if no one was home, to just leave them on the porch. I thought about those flowers all day. I also decided it was time to have a special talk with Lydia that night. I needed to express my feelings and explain why I had been acting the way I had for so many months. I just hoped I hadn't waited too long. When I got home, Lydia had a small smile on her face as she set dinner on the table. I noticed the bouquet of flowers on the table and asked her where they came from. She looked me in the eye, then glanced away, hesitating before answering. I stopped at the store and saw them in the flower department and bought them. Aren't they beautiful? Yes, very pretty, I replied, but now I was worried. She never mentioned the card and had lied to me about where she got the flowers. I felt a deep ache inside. I told Lydia I needed to talk to her after we put the girls to bed. It was very important. She looked puzzled but agreed to listen. I needed to explain why I had been acting strangely, hoping she would understand. I felt I was losing her, especially with her friend visiting on Friday. Lydia, I have to tell you what's been going on in my life. I've been holding it in too long, I began. Lydia interrupted me. Helen, is she the one you're having an affair with? I always thought she was our friend. I can't believe it. I interrupted. An affair? Helen and I didn't have an affair. Where did you get that idea? You've been so distant for the last few months. I figured you were having an affair. I just didn't know with whom, Lydia replied. Stop. I haven't been having an affair. I've been struggling with the after effects of one of my cases. I was sent to talk to Helen because she's our station psychologist. She told me I should be talking to you. And that's what I'm trying to do. Please stop interrupting me with these affair accusations. I'm sorry for interrupting. I'll try to listen to what you have to say. I hope it's not just a ploy so I don't go out with my friends tomorrow. I began my story about a murder and attempted suicide from about six months ago. A very successful businessman, about my age, had shot his two kids and then fired multiple times at his wife before attempting to take his own life. It was hard on me, too. We don't get too many cases like that. When I found the man alive, I wanted to confront him myself. Those poor little kids never knew what hit them. I couldn't stop thinking about Kira and Brittany. It was such a horrible sight. When I came home that night, I held you and hugged the girls. It was something I'll never forget. I just couldn't understand why a man would do that. When I talked to some of his neighbors and co-workers, they said he had the perfect marriage. They were always happy and hardly ever argued, which was a lot like us. Two days later, I finally got a chance to talk to the husband. The shot to his chest was self-inflicted as we suspected, but he missed his heart by a few millimeters. The first thing he said to me was to ask me to kill him. He didn't want to live. He told me to unplug his life support. He had always thought they had a great marriage, never dreaming his wife would betray him. He believed he had the perfect life, a wonderful wife and great kids. There were no financial worries, and the family was full of love. He had been away on business, expecting to be gone for two more days, but finished early and caught a red-eye flight home to surprise them. Upon arriving, he noticed a strange car in the driveway, so he parked in front of the house. The only light on was in the bedroom. Quietly, he got out of his car, unlocked the front door, and stepped inside. A faint sound from the bedroom caught his attention. He hesitated at the closed doors of his children's rooms, then walked toward his own bedroom. Peering in, he was taken aback by what he saw his wife with another man. He stood frozen, disbelief washing over him. After a moment, he backed away, his mind swirling. He left the house in a daze, driving to his office. Once there, he opened his safe and took out his revolver, feeling a surge of emotions he could hardly process. Returning home, he found his wife kissing the man, who soon drove away. Without thinking, he followed the man to a nearby town. In a parking garage, the confrontation escalated, leading to a tragic decision that left him feeling hollow. When he returned home, a dark cloud hung over him. He felt an overwhelming impulse to erase the pain, which led to irreversible choices that shattered his family. As the night unfolded, his wife, 
alerted by the sound of chaos, cried out in horror. The weight of his actions bore down on him, and as he faced the consequences, he realized the gravity of his decisions. The aftermath was grim. Neighbors heard the chaos and called for help, but it was too late. As the story came to light, the tragic links between their lives unfolded, revealing layers of hurt and betrayal. Reflecting on the events, Lydia's voice trembled as she asked Jerry if he truly thought she could ever betray him like that. Tears filled her eyes as she expressed her fears. It wasn't just about him. It was about the possibility of losing everything she held dear. The thought of being driven to such despair haunted her. Lately, she sensed a change in him, a distance that made her anxious. I know you haven't been entirely honest with me lately. I can't remember you ever lying to me before, but over the last few months, I've noticed you dressing more provocatively. It makes me worried about losing you and how I might react. I think I love you too much. It's a fine line between love and obsession. I just wanted to share my feelings with you. When I looked up, I saw that Lydia was crying. She didn't say a word and ran into the bathroom. I was confused and anxious. I had just poured my heart out to her. Did I say something wrong? I felt like a nervous wreck. I decided to head to the club and give Lydia some space to think. I hoped I had done my best and that she felt the same. When I returned from the club, the house was dark and Lydia seemed to be sleeping. I chose to sleep on the couch, wanting to avoid any more confrontations that night. Friday morning, I woke up early, dressed quickly, and kissed the girls goodbye. I told Lydia through the bathroom door that I would be home at 6 o'clock to take care of the girls while she went out with her friends. I didn't wait for a reply. I just got in my car and left. The day didn't go well for me. I took my frustrations out on the people I stopped, giving out tickets without hesitation. By the end of my shift, I was glad to be done until Monday. As I drove home, I imagined Lydia dressed up for someone else, and the thought frustrated me. When I opened the front door, the smell of dinner wafted through the air. Lydia greeted me in a comfortable outfit, reaching up to pull me down for a kiss. Welcome home, honey, she said. What's going on? Shouldn't you be getting ready to go out with your friends? I asked. Kira and Brittany ran in and hugged me. Mommy's going to the amusement park with us tomorrow. She said she would rather be with us than her old friends, Kira replied. Is this true, Lydia? What changed your mind? I asked. I thought your plan B would be a lot more fun, she said. I'll tell you my side of the story later. Right now, dinner is getting cold, and you don't like cold steak. My favorite dinner twice in one week? There really is a god. I laughed. We all sat down to eat. The girls shared stories about their day at school, and Lydia told me about hers. When they asked about my day, I mentioned how many people had gotten tickets for speeding. Lydia smiled and said, Well, you can't marry any of them because you're already married. We all laughed, but the girls looked at us with confusion. After dinner, the girls grabbed their suitcases and began packing for our trip to the park. Lydia laughed as they insisted on bringing all their toys. No, girls. You can only take one toy to play with in the car. You need a change of clothes and your pajamas. Don't forget your swimsuits if you want to swim in the motel pool. Can we go swimming in the pool? Brittany asked, her eyes sparkling with excitement. I looked over at my two happy little girls. Of course. We'll ride rides, swim in the pool, and eat at any restaurant you want. It's our family weekend. The girls jumped up and down, squealing with joy. Once Lydia finally calmed them down and tucked them in for the night, I settled onto the couch, waiting for her to come and talk to me. When she entered the room, she sat down in the chair next to me. I'm sorry for crying yesterday, Lydia began. I was upset for so many reasons. Jerry, I love you. I thought you had a girlfriend, and I didn't know how to handle it. I remember that night about six months ago when you were so passionate with me, but then you started pulling away after that conversation about the murder or suicide. I was confused and worried. I waited a week, but you didn't talk to me at all. I was mad when you said you pictured me cheating. I thought you trusted me more than that, she continued. Then I began to think about what you were going through. You shouldn't have had to face it alone. We could have worked through it together. I was worried that you were falling out of love with me. I thought maybe you thought I'd gained too much weight. So I started exercising and lost 15 pounds. I bought new clothes, hoping you'd notice, but I didn't think you did. 
It felt like the only time we were intimate was when I initiated it, and it seemed rushed. Last Monday, it felt like you were doing it out of some sort of revenge because I wanted to go out, and that hurt my pride. I didn't like that side of you, she said looking down. I stopped talking to you because every time I said something, you yelled at me. I can't tell you how much that hurt. You never raised your voice at me before. I was afraid to ask you anything. And then you started going to the club almost every night. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know how to fix it. You bought me flowers, didn't you? Why didn't you tell me? She asked. I was scared to death when I received them. You know I like yellow carnations, so I thought you did it out of spite. Why did you do that? I replied. I wanted to see if you had a boyfriend or someone else in your life. I hoped you would tell me about it when I got home. I lied and said I bought them myself because I was afraid of your reaction, she admitted. The same thing happened when I asked who you were going out with, and you lied to me then, too. I didn't want to lie, but I was scared. We hadn't talked at all. So now, let's talk. Do you have someone else? My God, no. You're my love. My only love, Lydia exclaimed. I wanted to tell you about a guy who was flirting with me, but I was half afraid to since you've been so distant. You know how we joke around with friends? There's a new guy, Matt, who joined our staff. I don't know much about him, but when he started coming on to me, I told him to back off because I'm a happily married woman. He laid low for a while, and I thought everything was okay. When Sally asked me to go out with the group last Monday, I figured, why not? You said no to me, and we hadn't gone out in months, so I told her yes. Later, she mentioned that Matt was going and it bothered me because I wanted nothing to do with him. Sally said there would be a lot of people going, about eight of us. Only two were men, Matt and Bill, who was bringing his wife, so I figured I was safe. I wanted to ask you to go, but you said no the last three times I asked, so I ended up not going either. I didn't tell you his name because I was afraid you would get mad at me. On Thursday, when I received the flowers, I thought they were from Matt. I wasn't sure what to do. I've never received flowers from anyone but you. When you came home and asked where they came from, I panicked. If they weren't from you, then Matt must have sent them. I was too scared to tell you, so I lied. I'm so sorry. I felt terrible for lying to you, but I didn't know what to do. This morning, I confronted Matt. I told him that I'm happily married and love my husband, and to stop sending me flowers or anything else, Lydia explained. He looked at me and said he never sent me flowers. That's when I realized it was you. I felt a bit foolish, but I told Matt to make sure he never did it again, or I'd send my husband to have a talk with him. Jerry, I love you with all my heart. There is no one else. There never has been and never will be. I need you to know that, Lydia said earnestly. I know. I love you too, and only you, I replied. No, Jerry, you don't understand. These aren't just words. Look me in the eyes. I know you can read my face, so stare at me and listen. Jerry, I love you and only you. Do you see the truth in my face? I could see the sincerity in her expression. I leaned forward and kissed her deeply. I see the truth and I honestly believe you, I replied. We got up and went to bed. She slipped on her new pajamas and I changed into my boxers. I grabbed us each a glass of soda and we watched a little TV while lying on the bed. I thought we were going to do that in the motel tomorrow, I teased. There's plenty more love where this came from, she replied with a smile. When we finished watching TV, we turned it off and cuddled together, something we hadn't done in a long time. Our love life felt renewed, and the rest of our weekend went wonderfully. We enjoyed our time with the girls, and at night, we let them have the big bed while we closed the bedroom door and slept on the sofa bed. We didn't get much sleep, but it was worth it. The following Monday, on my way to work, I bought a dozen yellow carnations and had them sent to the house, signing the card simply, to the woman I love. Thank you for the wonderful weekend. When I got home, the flowers were on the table, and next to them stood my beautiful, smiling wife. She handed me the card and asked, were these from you? If not, you better find out who sent them. She smiled and kissed me. I asked her how school went that day, and she chuckled. My friends went out, and this Matt guy went with them. He asked Sally where she was. Sally told him, Matt, stay away from Lydia if you know what's good for you. She's happily married to a psycho cop who's about 6 feet 5 inches and weighs about 250 pounds, 
and will literally wipe you out if Lydia tells him how you've been making a play for her. So what did he say to you today? I asked. Other than saying hi, he stayed away from me. I think he believes I have leprosy. Lydia laughed. Jerry, let's make another baby. I want to have a son with you, she said, her eyes sparkling. I smiled at her. Honey, if it's what you want, we'll practice day and night. If we have another girl, I just hope she's healthy and looks like you and the girls. I have the most beautiful family I know. Our lives were back to normal. We had dinner together most nights, and the girls told us about their days while Lydia and I discussed ours. No more secrets between us. About two weeks later, Lydia told me her group of friends was going out again and that she wanted to go. I looked a bit concerned until she added, I'll only go if you go with me. I want to wear that little black dress I bought last time. Can we go? I thought for a moment and looked her in the eyes. Only if you wear that black outfit you bought to go with it. She smiled. You know me too well. I wanted to surprise you, but I should have known I can't keep anything from you. Mom said she would watch the girls, but I promised them we'd take them somewhere next week, so we can go clubbing this week and to the zoo with the girls next week. Have I told you lately how much I love you, Jerry Walker? Just about every day, which is how I like it, I grinned. We went out with her friends and had a fantastic time. This Matt guy was a no-show, which was probably a wise move on his part. After our night of partying, Lydia and I went to our room. We could make all the noise we wanted that we couldn't at home. Let's make that baby, Lydia said. I'm off the pill. I could see by the look on her face that she was serious. We embraced passionately, exploring each other with renewed enthusiasm. Three months later, Lydia asked me to go shopping with her. She had been gaining weight and wanted to buy a couple of outfits. The girl stood nearby and asked, Mom, why are you gaining weight? Well, I have a surprise for you. You girls are going to have a baby brother in about six months. She looked up at me with tears of joy in her eyes, and I knew she was telling the truth. We never lied or kept anything from each other again. We shared our daily stories, and I made sure to deal with any unwanted advances. We both knew that the answer to most marital problems was a lack of communication, and we weren't going to let that happen again. For those who wondered what happened to John, the man who killed his family, he healed and then went to court, where he was found guilty on four counts of premeditated murder. He is now on death row, awaiting his date with destiny and has turned down all appeals. Story 2 My parents always told me that you need to maintain good relations with your neighbors and not quarrel with them. It was easy for me because I was a friendly and sociable guy. However, because of maintaining a good relationship, I missed a very important detail that led to my life collapsing. Now, I scrutinize my neighbors more closely. I glanced at my reflection in the mirror, adjusting my tie to ensure it sat snugly around my neck. With a smile, I checked my teeth for any remnants of food, keen to present a flawless appearance. Addressing my reflection, I remarked, Jeff, you're looking fantastic. Satisfied with my own wit, I stepped back, collected my wallet, watch, and a fresh handkerchief, and then made my way downstairs to the kitchen feeling as prepared as I could be. The aroma of coffee greeted me as I entered the kitchen, prompting me to reach for a cup from the small rack on the counter. Ah, coffee smells wonderful. I definitely need a cup before tackling this task. The task at hand was a meeting I dreaded with a vendor I strongly disliked, but it was unavoidable. Thankfully, it was scheduled first thing, so the remainder of the day should be bearable. While I didn't loathe my job, it had become monotonous, and I yearned for a change. If nothing changed soon, I was determined to take matters into my own hands. I was conversing with Essie, my wife of 19 years, and the love of my life. Technically, her name was Contessa, but everyone affectionately referred to her as Essie. It originated from her younger sister's inability to pronounce her full name correctly, resulting in Essie sticking. Our son Philip recently departed for college, leaving our home empty, a situation commonly termed as an empty nest, though the reasoning behind that term eluded me. After all, Essie and I still remained, and we held significant significance, or so I believed. Yet, who truly comprehended the quirks of colloquial expressions used when words failed. Turning my focus to my reserved wife, I inquired, Do you have any plans for today? I should be back on time, and I was thinking perhaps we could dine out tonight. It would spare you from having to cook, 
and it's been a while since we've done that. It might be enjoyable. I proposed the idea, half expecting her customary rejection. She responded, No, I don't have any concrete plans, but I might go shopping, explore some stores, or something similar. As for dinner, I'll pass. I'll likely be too exhausted anyway. I'll just order some takeout instead, she said, not meeting my gaze, likely having not done so since I entered the room or initiated the conversation. It had been quite some time since she had paid me any attention, longer than I could recall. Well, I didn't anticipate you'd be up for it, but I thought I'd ask. Takeout works. You've really mastered that, I remarked, dripping with sarcasm. In spite of Though acknowledging the truth in her culinary skills, I felt confident making such remarks, knowing she wouldn't bother with more than a disinterested word or two in response. And as expected, she simply glanced up briefly before returning to her indifference, fitting perfectly into the established pattern of our interactions. One that had been in place long before today, long before Philip left for college, and certainly unrelated to the empty nest syndrome that my friend, an amateur therapist, insisted was the root cause. Essie had undergone significant changes in a relatively short span. Short considering the 19 years of our happy marriage, preceded by a year of courtship. We had once been a unified team, sharing dreams and plans openly. However, about a year ago, things began to shift, and the transformation grew more pronounced with time. The Essie I had married was slowly becoming a stranger within our own home, and the sense of loss was tearing me apart. The crux of the issue lay in her denial and refusal to address it. Indeed, many things had changed recently. Previously, she used to accompany Phil to the gym when he was around, but he mentioned that she had ceased doing so several months prior to his departure. Although she still appeared fit and toned, it was becoming evident that she was beginning to gain weight around the waist, with a slight protrusion of a tummy. It wasn't significant enough to diminish her attractiveness, but it signaled a shift. Furthermore, she had started to display irritability and snappiness towards me. While not overtly significant, our conversations often ended with her making subtle jabs about my habits or work schedule, suggesting my hours were too long or that I traveled excessively, despite the fact that I rarely worked overtime anymore and hadn't traveled in seven months. The SE I knew would have discussed any issues before resorting to such behavior. Her demeanor had changed drastically, affecting our interactions with others. Despite being just 42, she looked younger, while I, nearing 49, made efforts to stay in shape for her. We used to pride ourselves on appearing younger than our ages, especially when we went out together, but it had been nearly a year since that had happened, without any apparent reason. She consistently refused to accompany me, and I stopped asking about it months ago. The sarcastic tone in her remarks about dinner plans tonight and her automatic response went unnoticed by her reflecting the current state of our relationship. Naturally, as a man, I couldn't help but notice that our once vibrant love life had dwindled away to nothing. We used to share an active and diverse sexual relationship, satisfying each other's desires completely. We were attuned to each other's preferences, ensuring mutual satisfaction. But everything changed. Despite my inquiries, pleas, and efforts to understand why she no longer desired intimacy, her response was merely a shrug, citing menopause and perpetual fatigue. She resisted seeking help and grew irritated when I persisted in my masculinity. I opted to let it go, hoping it would resolve itself with time. As I sat across from my wife, these thoughts weighed heavily on my mind. Finishing my coffee, I cleaned my cup and placed it in the sink. Grabbing my briefcase by the door, I glanced back at her motionless at the table and uttered, I'll see you tonight. There was no reply. I stepped out of the door and headed towards my car, burdened by the weight of the world on my shoulders. Oh, how I had cherished that woman throughout my adult life. How I had yearned to grow old alongside her, fulfilling all the dreams and aspirations we had shared in our youth. The adventures we imagined, the places we longed to explore. It wasn't even a year ago when she had discussed the possibility of us relocating to Florida if I secured the promotion to regional VP. It remained a viable option. She despised living in the Midwest where winters were harsh and summers lacked warmth. The cold was her nemesis. Despite my lingering depression, I entered my office and flicked on the lights. Settling behind my desk, I powered up my computer and waited. 
I poured myself a cup of office coffee, snagged a donut from the communal box, and returned to check my email. As I nibbled on a coffee-soaked piece of donut, I opened a message from my boss, urging me to promptly visit his office. I smirked at the familiarity of the summons. TJ and I shared a long history, both of us starting at Edmonds Manufacturing around the same time. Now he held the position of Senior VP of Design and Implementation, while I served as a Senior Manager in Research and Design. After polishing off the donut, I wiped my face clean and strolled down the corridor towards his corner office. Along the way, I exchanged a greeting with Art Malone, my close friend and confidant. As I passed by his desk, a brief exchange, a promise to catch up later, and then onward to TJ's office. Pausing to chat with Morin, his secretary, she directed me to go straight in. He was expecting me. Little did I know that meeting would alter the course of my life, for better and for worse. He announced that I had been promoted to Vice President of Design for the Southeast Region. Soon, I'd be relocating to Miami. Once I delegated my responsibilities and wrapped up ongoing projects, the move could be completed in less than a month. Finally, I had attained the coveted position I had longed for. S.E. and I could settle in Miami, enjoying the perks of a comfortable home, possibly one by the shore with a boat slip and a spacious sailboat, perhaps even motorized. After informing Art, coordinating with my second-in-command, and outlining the status of ongoing projects for closure or handover, I realized it was well past lunchtime. Sending everyone out for lunch, I took a moment to call home, eager to share the news with Essie. However, after dialing her number, I was met only with her answering machine. Opting not to leave a message, I attempted her cell next, but it too went straight to voicemail. Assuming she was with Jane, as she mentioned, I decided to head home early, intending to persuade her to join me for a celebratory dinner. Surely this occasion warranted a special meal. En route, I stopped by the florist to pick up two dozen long-stemmed roses in her favorite color, pink, along with a large box of chocolates filled with nuts, also her preferred choice. I had the card printed with the message, we finally secured the transfer to our dream location. I love you, Jeff. I drove home the entire way with a tune on my lips, a goofy smile plastered across my face. I felt ecstatic, like I was on cloud nine. Finally, our dreams were turning into reality. A fresh start and a new life awaited us in Miami. Essie would transform, returning to her lively self, and we could embark on this journey together. We'd be a team again, just like old times, before things started to change with her. I pushed aside that thought. Today marked a new beginning. Nothing could stand in our way now. Pulling into the driveway much faster than usual, I narrowly avoided slamming into the garage door. I needed to calm down. Happiness was overwhelming me. Everything was falling into place perfectly. That reminded me to grab the roses from the back seat, along with the candy and the card, before heading inside. I entered the room, setting down my keys before carrying the flowers and candy into the living area, intending to surprise Essie upon her return. Approaching the couch where I planned to place the gifts, I froze in my tracks, shocked by the scene unfolding before me. Essie sat on the couch with Bill Parker, our neighbor and former friend, in an undeniably intimate position. My mind raced as I took in every detail, their disheveled appearance and the obvious closeness between them. It was painfully clear that this was no accident or first-time occurrence. For a few moments, I stood there in disbelief my emotions rapidly shifting from confusion to deep anger. I felt betrayed, replaced, and as the weight of the situation sank in, a part of me wanted to lash out in rage. But that wasn't who I was. Gradually, my initial urge for a physical response gave way to a clearer, more deliberate decision. Still holding the flowers, chocolates, and card, I stepped into the room, walking around the couch until I stood right in front of them. Parker, startled, turned to face me with a simple, oh, while Essie's expression quickly shifted from shock to panic. Essie's eyes snapped open, meeting mine with a mixture of alarm and recognition. The lust in her gaze waned, replaced by widening eyes that seemed on the verge of bulging from their sockets. She shook her head vigorously, repeating no, 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 in a panicked mantra, realizing her predicament, she attempted to push Bill away while he simultaneously attempted to retreat, 
resulting in him awkwardly seated on the floor in front of me, nearly landing on my shoes. As she gazed at me, tears filling her eyes and her lips quivering with shame, she struggled to adjust her skirt and fasten her blouse. A challenging task with both hands occupied. I observed, my disgust evident on my face. However, as she met my gaze again, attempting to speak, my disgust waned, replaced by the agony of witnessing the deterioration of my world. I experienced betrayal, loss, anger, and ultimately pain. Realizing it was over, I had lost her irreversibly, with no path to reconciliation. I resolved to end it then and there. I grabbed the two dozen long-stemmed roses from their vase and hurled them at her, watching as they struck her face before cascading onto the couch and floor. The vase followed, crashing against the wall behind her. Next, I emptied the box of chocolates onto the floor and tossed the card onto the couch's edge. Now I comprehend why you're always too exhausted to join me for dinner or make love. It's clear to me now. I turned to Bill Parker, who was struggling to pull up his pants and put on his shoes. I waited until he straightened himself up. Then I unleashed all the anger I had been feeling, hitting him squarely in the face. I felt a grim satisfaction as blood spurted from his mouth, and he collapsed once more. As he struggled to rise on his arms, I addressed him directly. I don't know how you plan to account for this to your wife after I inform her about your afternoon escapades with my soon-to-be ex-wife, but you better be ready to explain. Now get the hell out of my house before I physically remove you. I uttered no further words but ascended the stairs to retrieve a suitcase and commence packing. Despite still seething with anger, it gradually waned, replaced by a profound, agonizing ache. The shattering of all my beliefs became almost unbearable. The ascent from the exhilaration of my promotion, followed by the plummet into the deepest depression of my life, left my legs unsteady. Almost unpacking, the intensity became overwhelming, halting me abruptly, collapsing to my knees on the bedroom floor. I wept as I hadn't since my mother's passing, allowing the emotions to flow. I realized there was little I could do to stem them. I waited until they subsided, leaving me hollow. I sensed her embrace, holding me tightly, with her cheek against my head, murmuring apologies as if I were an infant. I'm so sorry, Jeff. I'm so sorry. Her words momentarily ceased my tears, reigniting my anger undeterred. Swallowing hard. I let the fury build until it blazed brightly once more. Remove your vile hands from me. Get away from me. Your scent of sex sickens me. I stood, my legs still trembling but gaining strength, and shut the suitcase. Glancing around, I spotted Essie on her knees, her face twisted in shock, tears streaming down. Despite her sobbing, I paid her no mind, heading to the bathroom. I fetched my shaving kit containing my razor, toothbrush, and various travel essentials, tossing them into a plastic bag. I returned to grab my suitcase, ignoring Essie blocking the doorway. I hurled the bag and suitcase down the stairs without a second thought. Returning inside, I hastily gathered a few items from my bedside table before descending the stairs to retrieve my belongings. As I stepped out the door, I could hear Essie's desperate pleas for me to halt, to turn back and engage in conversation but I was determined to leave that place behind. It was in that moment that I realized my marriage had reached its end, and perhaps I even felt a slight sense of relief that the inevitable had finally arrived. Over the past year, everything had been leading to this moment, and now it was time to acknowledge that it was over. The constant criticism, avoidance, disregard for my needs, and the utter lack of respect I had endured had ceased. Miami beckoned, and I was embarking on this journey alone. When I left, I left an envelope for Bill's wife. Joyce needs to know the truth about her husband, and I think I did the right thing. After getting a new job, a new place to call home, and the freedom to spend the rest of my life with someone who would appreciate me for who I am, I decided to leave the past behind without looking back. For quite some time now, I've been experiencing feelings of depression and anxiety. A part of it stems from knowing that Philip will soon be off to college leaving me alone for most of the day. Another part arises from entering that phase in a woman's life preceding menopause, where doubts about youth, beauty, and vitality begin to surface. My world has revolved around Jeff, Philip, our home, 
and ensuring their comfort and safety for so long that the thought of losing it all fills me with dread. Above all, I've been feeling inexplicably odd lately, a sensation I can't quite pinpoint, something I couldn't articulate to a doctor. It's just a pervasive sense that something isn't right. I feel disconnected from myself, and it's starting to concern me. I've been hesitant to confide in Jeff about it, because I know he'll want to intervene and find a solution. Being a man, he tends to approach problems with a fix-it mentality. But I don't want things to be fixed. I just want to be left alone to tend to my own needs. Nothing needs fixing. I just need space to navigate this on my own. He had previously discussed with me my reluctance to socialize or engage in activities, as well as the decline of our intimate relationship, which I currently had little to no interest in. Though I couldn't pinpoint why, I used to enjoy being intimate with my husband, and there was no apparent reason for this change. I simply lack the energy to engage in it now, but I believe this would eventually change. Time would heal, and I would return to my previous state. I just needed time. Despite his disbelief, I was aware of how terribly I was neglecting him. He made efforts to spend time together, suggesting dinners, outings, or activities, but none of his suggestions sparked any interest within me. Eventually, I grew weary of his attempts and began responding with hostility, saying hurtful things that I later regretted but never apologized for. Gradually, I started to detach myself, disregarding my husband's pleas and often neglecting my son as well. As time passed, the situation deteriorated further, but by then, it was too late for me to reverse it. At first, I wasn't aware of it, but the start of my decline had begun. I started neglecting my gym sessions with Philip, as I doubted I would continue once he departed. Truth be told, I didn't derive much enjoyment from it, but Philip cherished the way it made him feel and wished the same for me. Despite appreciating his enthusiasm, I never fully embraced it like he did. Gradually, I began to skip more and more sessions. However, it was mere coincidence that events unfolded just after I resolved to quit. Although I lost interest in working out with my son, I found solace in the attention from other men at the gym. However, it wasn't for any reason other than to boost my self-esteem. Their significance to me didn't extend beyond that, particularly not in a romantic sense. I wasn't even sexually attracted to my husband, so the likelihood of being aroused by someone else, especially a stranger, was slim. I remained disinterested until Bill Parker started frequenting the gym more often. Bill, our neighbor from next door, lived with his wife Joyce, who was a recluse bordering on agoraphobia. Initially, she only ventured out when absolutely necessary, occasionally attending parties but preferring to host gatherings at home. Despite invitations from others, she declined without offering excuses. Bill attempted to persuade her to seek treatment, but she adamantly refused to leave the house, barely engaging with anyone beyond phone conversations, which she quickly discontinued. Consequently, she became increasingly housebound. Like many of his friends, I had stopped visiting Joyce, feeling burdened by her issues and uneasy in her presence. Was I much of a friend after all? Bill, who was a decade or more my senior, owned a small hardware store in our town. However, when Joyce fell ill and began to stay home, he made the decision to sell his store in order to be close to her. Having shared over 30 years with her, he felt it his obligation to support her. Despite his efforts, her condition deteriorated, and eventually, she seldom left the house except for medical appointments or emergencies. Eventually, she stopped leaving altogether. During our breaks at the gym, Bill and I started conversing, and I gained insight into his and Joyce's situation. Although I expressed regret for not visiting Joyce more often, Bill simply nodded in understanding as he shared their story. I couldn't help but empathize with him, witnessing the sadness that weighed on him. Though I yearned to assist him, all I could offer was a listening ear. My sympathy for him grew as he spoke, yet I felt powerless to alter their circumstances. I found Bill to be an appealing individual, and upon closer observation, I noticed he had a well-proportioned physique with a toned stomach. I must admit I couldn't help but notice the way his snug gym shorts highlighted his form. Particularly intriguing was how this became more noticeable during our conversations. It sparked thoughts that had been absent for a while. However, these thoughts faded when Bill was out of sight. Evenings with my husband didn't seem to bring them back. They only stirred when I encountered Bill again at the gym. 
This prompted reflection. During our next encounter, while observing Phil's workout, I gathered the courage to ask Bill about his relationship with Joyce. He appeared initially uncomfortable, but eventually confided that their romantic life had diminished. Joyce seemed uninterested and had grown distant, and he felt a sense of obligation to remain by her side due to her health issues and their past together. That evening at home, I came to a decision. I realized I could help Bill while also addressing my own emotional needs. It became clear to me that if Bill could rekindle feelings within me, and if he was struggling in his marriage, perhaps we could support each other. My plan was to connect with Bill in a way that fulfilled both our needs. Since I found little intimacy with my husband and Bill felt similarly distant from Joyce, it appeared to be a practical solution to our dilemmas. At that moment in my life, I didn't view my actions as betraying my husband. I simply felt unfulfilled in my marriage, and Bill seemed to be in a similar situation. I believe that by engaging in this arrangement, I might reignite my own desires, which could potentially benefit my marriage. Wouldn't that be advantageous for Jeff? Bill could find solace in our companionship, and I anticipated that I would also find satisfaction. It seemed like a mutually beneficial arrangement. With that realization, my decision was made. The next day, I went to the gym with Philip, and to my surprise, Bill was already there. I watched him work out, admiring how his body glistened with sweat. I felt a longing to connect with him, stirring feelings I hadn't experienced in a long time. Just watching him was exciting. It reaffirmed my choice. After his workout, I spoke with Bill and shared my thoughts. He listened with genuine interest, smiling widely and even blushing. He admitted he had been considering a move for some time but was hesitant, fearing it might jeopardize our friendship. While he had reservations about pursuing this behind Jeff's back, I explained our lack of intimacy, which he seemed to understand. In truth, Bill would have welcomed any opportunity to connect with me. I recognized that Bill had a strong presence. We arranged our first meeting at my house. Bill planned to let Joyce know he needed to step out for a bit, then discreetly come over when it was safe. With Jeff at work and Philip away on a trip, I would have the house to myself that morning. I waited in the kitchen, watching the backyard until I saw him arrive. He quickly closed the gate and hurried towards the back door, which I opened for him. It wasn't until he stopped and turned that he noticed I was wearing only a robe. With a smile, I stood there as he caught his breath, then casually untied the belt, allowing the robe to fall open. I had taken care to present myself well today. He let out a small gasp as his gaze moved over me. I felt a thrill at his admiration, so I shrugged off the robe, letting it drop to the floor. Standing there, I felt a rush of confidence as he took me in. He was my neighbor and Jeff's friend, but in that moment, there was a strong connection between us. Without waiting long, he stepped toward me, drawing me close and kissing me gently. His warmth sparked excitement within me. I was momentarily stunned, doubting my decision for the first time, but those doubts faded quickly. I found myself enjoying this newfound connection, feeling alive again. By the time I regained my composure, Bill had also shed his layers. He guided me to the counter, lifting me effortlessly, supporting my body. We shared a moment of pure joy, both of us completely lost in the experience. When he gently set me back down, I felt a sense of contentment wash over me. After I stepped away to freshen up, I returned to find Bill already dressed and sitting at the table, looking at me with a mix of admiration and tiredness. I smiled, walked over to give him a light kiss on the cheek, and sat down across from him. Thank you, Bill. That was more than I expected. I really enjoyed it and I hope this is just the start of something special between us. No, thank you, Essie. I never anticipated this. I've never felt such a strong connection. You're incredible, and I agree we should explore this further. Could we meet again tomorrow at the same time? I believe it could work. Phil will be at school, and next time we can be more comfortable in a different setting. I think we'll have more time to enjoy each other's company. That marked the beginning of our relationship, which flourished almost daily until the end of the school term. Afterward, we became more cautious, meeting once or twice a week, sometimes even less. Despite this, Bill was a wonderful companion, and I cherished our moments together. The challenge arose when none of my experiences with Bill translated into my relationship with my husband. I found myself feeling less inclined to be intimate with Jeff, 
justifying my actions in my mind. Though I recognized my complicated feelings, I was reluctant to change. I felt caught between my connection with Bill and my marriage with Jeff. In fact, I grew resentful towards Jeff for his inability to connect with me in the same way that Bill did. I was certain I didn't love Bill, and the idea of sharing my life with him never crossed my mind. However, my feelings for Jeff surprised me, a realization that came too late. Despite this, I held on to the assurance that I had Jeff's love to rely on, which gave me a sense of security. It's curious how I never questioned that aspect. The thought of losing my husband never even registered as a concern. As summer came to an end, Philip left for college while Jeff continued his work routine, which allowed Bill and me more chances to meet in private. Despite the gradual decline of my relationship with Bill, we continued to see each other as often as possible. I particularly enjoyed the way he made me feel appreciated, often letting him continue for as long as he wished. He seemed pleased to be bringing me joy, and I was complicit in that. That's exactly what we were doing when Jeff unexpectedly walked in on us. Looking back, I can picture it as clearly as if it happened just an hour ago. I was sitting on the couch in the living room, feeling vulnerable, while Bill was close to me, smiling. Just as I began to feel a rush of emotion, Bill suddenly pulled away. When I opened my eyes, I was met not with affection, but with the gaze of my husband Jeff, who stood there shocked. Certain moments from that encounter remain vivid in my memory. The first look into his eyes revealed a mix of hurt and confusion. However, as time passed, I saw a transformation in him. Gradually, his initial anger shifted to something deeper and more heartbreaking. Pain mixed with sorrow. This was a feeling I had encountered before with Jeff, but this time it felt more profound. Witnessing his anguish, knowing I was the cause, brought a pain that was unlike anything I had felt before even more so than the loss of my parents in a tragic accident. That haunting look will linger in my memory for a long time. Yet, as distressing as that moment was, it was nothing compared to what followed. Bill hastily dressed and left the house, mumbling a quick apology. Watching him go, I realized that for the first time in nearly a year, I felt nothing for him. His fate no longer mattered to me. As I made my way upstairs to find Jeff, I couldn't fully grasp the gravity of the situation or how dramatically my life was about to change. All I knew was that I needed to face my husband and try to explain. When I entered the bedroom, I froze in disbelief. My beloved husband, the man I cherished, the one who provided a warm and loving home for me and our son, was kneeling on the floor, his head in his hands, tears streaming down his face, his heart shattered. In that moment, it felt as if my own heart stopped beating. All I could think was that I wished to be taken away to spare me from witnessing the pain I had caused him. The realization of my actions crushed me. Without hesitation, I approached him, knelt behind him, and wrapped my arms around him. I held him tightly, murmuring reassurances that everything would eventually be alright. I needed him to hear my apology, to understand my regret. I'm so sorry, Jeff. I'm so sorry. I repeated, hoping he could sense my sincerity amidst his pain. My only intention was to offer comfort, to express my love for him as a devoted wife. But he pushed me away, distancing himself from me as if my presence pained him. His anger was palpable, and his words cut deep, lingering in my thoughts long after. Please, just leave me alone. They say your life flashes before your eyes when faced with overwhelming loss. Perhaps that's true, for in that moment, it felt like a part of me died too. Not my entire life, just the fragments of joy I shared with Jeff. Our life together, our home, the precious moments as a family, the dreams we held dear for our future. Everything we cherished, everything we built together, vanished that day, and a piece of me vanished with them. Today finds me seated in a modest apartment that I rent on a monthly basis. Financially, I could afford something grander since Jeff left me well off, but I lack the desire for such extravagance. Before me lay the final divorce papers, signaling the permanent end of my marriage. Jeff has moved on with his life. Now we're in Miami, a city we once dreamed of together, though it feels like ages ago. It's only been about a year. I found the note he left the day he departed, its words echoing the weight of my loss. It was a simple note, our dream destination. I love you, Jeff. 
My feelings of indifference have returned, momentarily quelled by my betrayal of my husband and my unsuccessful attempts to salvage our marriage. I fought earnestly, but Jeff's refusal to engage in dialogue or understand my actions hindered any progress. Eventually, I realized that the why was inconsequential, especially to Jeff. What could I possibly say to him? I had betrayed him repeatedly, even after my efforts to reignite our love had faded. It was acceptable to deceive myself, but I couldn't deceive him, not after what I had done. At first, our son Philip was furious with me, but in the end, he forgave me. He represents my only connection to my past life, living with a man who adored me and whom I loved dearly in return. The sudden disappearance of that passion remains a mystery to me. Despite countless attempts, I can't figure out why it faded away. However, it seems useless to dwell on this now because it is too late to change the course of events. My current existence reflects the emptiness that has reigned since Jeff's departure. I remain motionless, absorbed in thoughts of my loss. Bill, whom I used to see regularly, has now disappeared from my life, not only because I have no desire to reunite with him, but also because his own life has taken a different turn. I am left alone with my memories. I often remember the mood I was in when I started my relationship with Bill. At the time, my motive seemed straightforward and appealing. I imagined the potential benefits, weighed the pros and cons, but never thought about the consequences of my actions. The possibility that things could go wrong never crossed my mind. I focused solely on what I could gain, not paying attention to what I could lose. Indeed, the consequences are inevitable. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.